Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday morning here at the Digital Cathedral. Glad you're with me. Hope your new year has started off strong and you're ready to roll and understand and learn a lot this year. Your eyes, I'll tell you right now, your eyes are going to open, your ears are going to open bigger in 2023 than they ever have in your entire life. So we're going to begin to explore some things this morning that I think you're going to find really interesting and it's probably going to be worthy of a, of a second listen. Let me just lay a preface here. Let me lay a little foundation down before I get into what I want to say because what I'm going to teach on this morning is going to shake your world. Every kingdom truth that you've ever learned, whether when you came out of religion, you began to learn about grace and you learned about the fatherhood of God. You learned about unconditional love without conditions, finished work of the cross, mercy that endures forever. All of these truths you began to learn and the first step in the process of actually integrating this into your life where you could live it was that you first had to embrace it as being true. When you embrace it, you might not have understood it all. There's probably still some mystery to it as you begin to embrace it, but at least you begin to know inwardly that there's something about this that really resonates with me and I see it as truth. Grace without works, grace apart from works. Righteousness as not being something we have to attain, but something that has been direct deposited into our life. Those things just begin to resonate. So the first step in the process of being able to live out grace and enjoy it was that you had to first embrace it. Then once you embraced it, you can begin to actually believe it. You can't believe until you embrace. You can't believe until you actually take hold of something and say, that's, that's truth right there. Might not understand it all. Haven't seen the depth of it, but I got it. It's, and then you can begin to believe it. Again, belief is, belief is not a work. I, de I define believing as an effortless response to revelation. And the revelation comes when you embrace a truth that resonates, even though you don't, as I said, you don't fully understand it. But as you embrace it, you begin to get this revelation of it. You begin to see the depth of it. And so you can believe it. And once you believe it, and it begins to grow within you to a level of maturity and understanding, then you can begin to speak it. And what you speak is actually a creative word that eventually will manifest what it was that you first began to embrace. It's a process. Now you can't shortcut the process. I have seen people that have seen a truth, but they haven't let it uh, germinate long enough to where it can really be birthed within them and they can begin to speak it as though it were really true and that it can be manifested within their life. All right. So there's a process, embrace, believe, confess. All right. And that leads to manifestation. You got that? Because I'm going to spend a couple of weeks talking about something that most of you have never heard any teaching on your entire life. And what I'd like for you to do is to just embrace it. You might not understand it all, but I think it's going to resonate over the next, I don't know, five, six weeks that we look at this, because this is revolutionary. This is, <laughs> this is getting out into some deep water, things you've never heard before. But when we think about everything, when we think about four things here, when we think about everything that the finished work of the cross has provided for us, we haven't near plummeted the depth of understanding that. When we consider the restoration of all things that were spoken by the prophets, I don't think our mind has reached out to understand all that that restoration involves. When we ponder on being as Jesus is in this present world, I, I don't think we've got our head around exactly how that's going to look or how we can really live it out. Although we know it's true that we are to be as he is. And so we've embraced that. Some of us have, are in the process of believing it. Some are, be, are beginning to speak it and you're beginning to walk it out. And number four, everything that the new creation has provided for us, everything that the new creation encompasses, I tell you, we haven't even scratched the surface on that. So there's four areas right there. Everything the finished work of the cross has given us, the restoration of all things, being as he is in this present world, and what the new creation really is about. We haven't, 
we have not plummeted the depths of that and that's why we're here at the digital cathedral we just keep taking it down like an like an onion one layer after another now there's an area that i want i want to address that i want to speak on that stands out and yet this thing that i'm going to talk about this morning and for the next four five six weeks is so far beyond our comprehension we just never give it any place and because we give it no place it has no opportunity to grow in our believing we haven't embraced it yet so what i want you to do over the next weeks is just embrace what i'm going to teach and let it let it what i call a crock pot just let it simmer put it on the back burner you're going to have a lot of questions you're going to say what if and how about and why just let it cook but i want you to see from scriptures some truth that involves these four little areas that we're talking about being as jesus is restoration of all things uh, everything the finished work of the cross has given us and what belongs to us as a brand new creation. It, now what I'm going to get into is still a mystery. It's going to take a work of grace to actually make it manifest and I fully understand that. But if you see this as a truth and we're going to have to come through the pro you're going to have to trust the process of embrace, believe and speak. And you can't leapfrog any of these steps in, in fulfilling this. Yet what I'm going to talk to you about is very central to the plan of the cross. Um, and I want to just explore it. I'm just putting it out for your consideration. I know you're going to have some questions. And I want you to ask questions of yourself. Ask questions to the spirit of truth. To unravel it and show you more. So are you ready for an adventure? That's what I want to know. This is, this is the start of a new year. I want to know if you're ready for an adventure. And if you are, then I want to begin at the beginning, as we always try to do at the Digital Cathedral, at the very beginning of how this all began to evolve. So I want to go to the law first mentioned in Scripture. There, there, there is a, a good law of hermeneutics, biblical interpretation, that is the law first mentioned. If you want to know about something, find out where it is first mentioned in the Scripture, and that pretty well gives you the best definition. So I want to start over and be ready now, fasten your seatbelts. I want to start in, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. God says this, The Lord God commanded the, the man in the garden and said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. How did death enter the human race? It entered it through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the tree God said, I don't want you to eat from because it has, it's going to produce death. So the initial problem that they were warned about, listen to me, the initial problem they were warned about was death. It was not sin. Sin's nowhere mentioned in that verse. Sin has nothing to do in that verse. The Hebrew word for death is, is spelled M-W-U-T-H, and I'm not going to even pretend to be able to pronounce the, the Hebrew there, but I, it is um, M-W-U-T-H. I suppose it's like muth. But what it means is this. It brings about death or to be put to death or surely die. Every usage, and I, I ran this through, every usage in the Old Testament where M-W-U-T-H is used has to do with a physical death. There's no mention of spiritual death. No mention of spiritual death whatsoever. The truth is, up to this point, Adam and, Adam and Eve, as they lived in the garden, and I don't know how many years that was, it could have been hundreds of years, I don't know. Up to that point, they were immortal, meaning there was no death in them. They didn't age, they didn't decay, they didn't deteriorate in their body. None of that took place. Now, there's a lot of opinion on what took place when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whether you think that's literal, metaphorical, symbolical, whatever. There's a lot of conjuncture and a lot of opinion on what took place when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I'll tell you what most of us were taught. This is what I was taught. I taught that when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they died spiritually. And they became separated from God because of the wording in that, 17th verse in the day. Now I'm gonna I want to I want to address that in a moment. In fact, I'm gonna challenge it pretty hard this morning. With what we've always accepted, this is when they died spiritually, spiritual death. 
The truth is this, there's not one iota of evidence that this meant spiritual death. Every time this word MWUTH is used, it applies to physical death. Up to this point, there was no physical death on the planet. There was no decay on the planet. How many years that went on, I have no idea. The truth is, spiritual death is simply not found. They did die physically. It took about a thousand years for Adam and Eve to die physically. I, I, I don't know if this is exactly true, so give me a little bit of grace on this. But from what I was able to, to Google and research, the cells in a human body regenerate for about the first 25 years of our life, and then they begin to decay. And at some point, it's been well accepted, just everybody said this is normal. It might take 50, 60, 70, 80 years from that point, but at some point then you begin to die or you die, but you begin the death process at age 25. <clears throat> so God warned them up about this. In my, what I'm seeing, my opinion, my, the revelation I'm getting on this in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, there's absolutely no evidence about this being spiritual death. He's talking about a physical death. The result of eating from the tree of self-determination, of you being your own God, determining what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil, is that it would produce physical death. Now let's just fast forward this just for a couple of minutes to the time that Jesus came. What, what was Jesus trying to accomplish when he came? What was he doing? By his own admission, he came to die on the cross. The cross was the plan. It was the instrument that would produce death. But why, why was the cross the plan? Why was the death of Jesus necessary? I think Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us. Romans chapter 6 verse 23, every person knows this verse. The wages of sin is death. So sin pays, uh, gives you a, writes you a check. And when we sin, that check gives us, you cash it automatically, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now I want us just to look at that for just, just a moment. Jesus had to solve the sin problem to solve the physical death problem that entered through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The wages of sin is death. Now, to solve the death problem for man, Jesus had to die for everybody. He had to collect that wage that sin produced for every mankind, for all of us in mankind. We all had died physically. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 says that as all died in Adam, even so shall all be made alive in Christ. There's no indication that's talking about spiritual. Everybody came to a place of physical death because of Adam. It entered the race. But in Christ, all shall be made alive. Jesus had to solve the sin problem to solve the death problem. In fact, if he did not solve the sin problem, and I wanna, I wanna get down into that sin in just a minute. If he didn't solve the sin problem, he couldn't conquer death. Jesus defeated the grave. In order to defeat the grave for mankind, he had to collect the wage for mankind, the paycheck of sin. Death is the direct effect of sin, physical death. So, we've all memorized that verse from John chapter 3, verse 16, right? John chapter 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting or have eternal life. Now, the, the word... The words eternal life are made up of, of two words, all right, two Greek words. The word eternal there is the word aeonius. It means an age long. It can vary. It's age long. It, it, it contrasts with brief, brief or fleeting. Aeonius is determined because it's an adjective. It's, just, it's determined in its length of time by the word that is connected to. In this case, it's life, or the word zoe, the life of God. In age, then, that expires or comes to an end <laughs> when the life of God ends, which is never. 
So what we're talking about here is an age of perpetual life. Listen, an age of perpetual life that never ends. The period of Aeonius or the age of Aeonius in this case has no end because it's an adjective that describes Zoe, the life of God, which has no beginning and no end. Full of life, no interruption, filled with vitality, no end. In other words, what he's talking about here is immortality. Immortality. John chapter 6, verse 23, let me read the whole verse for you. John chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death, but the gift is eternal life. Now, if I read that verse correctly, then I have to say that the gift of eternal life kryptonites the death, the wage that sin has brought to man. So what was Jesus doing? Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus die? Jesus picked up the tab. He collected on our behalf the wage that sin was paying as it entered the human race through Adam, which is death, physical death. He died our death. He pulled us into himself. He embraced us so that we could die in him and receive the gift. All right. I want you to understand this. It's appointed unto man once to die, right? And then the judgment. Now, if we died in Christ, then we are judged already righteous. Did we die in Christ? 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Let me just run through several verses. Now, I, I know I'm co covering a lot of ground this morning. I'm going to continue to cover, but it's, just stay with me over the next four or five, six weeks because we're going to bring this all into clarity. I'm just, I'm plowing ground this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, For the love of God constrains us because we judge thus, that if Christ died or collected the wage of sin for all, then all died. He embraced us, pulled us in, collected the wage for us so that we don't have to physically die. Romans chapter 3, another verse that we all learned in our days and we accounted it to spiritual I don't think there's any evidence it's talking about spiritual. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified, verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right? So we, we, all, we all sin. We all have come into that place where we die physically. But he says in the last part of that verse, or in verse 24, that we've been justified freely. Now, we all teach verse 23, but very few teach verse 24, which again, kryptonites verse 23. The justification is stronger than the death that comes by sin. All right, let me, let me give you just one more. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised... Jesus from the dead, physically, physical death, the spirit that raised Jesus physically from the dead, if it dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the physical death will also give life in infusion, will give life, will infuse you with his life, which is Zoe, it has no end, right? It's eternal, it's Aeonius Zoe. It's eternal life. The age doesn't end because the life of God doesn't end. He infuses you with that. If the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken or give life to your mortal, the body that is subject to death. It'll give life, the Zoe, eternal, to that which is subject to death by his spirit who dwells in, in you. So the divine life comes into the mortal. Now let me just say this, I'm getting excited. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 speaks directly to physical life. He's not talking about spiritual life here. He's talking about infusing your mortal body with his life. His life does not end. Most people take eternal life that Jesus, you know, brought to mean that after we die, then we enter into eternal life. So what we've always taught, what we've always believed is that you live, you die, and then you live eternally. 
We've made it spiritual life, not physical life, and that's, that's a result of our religious thinking. The problem is this. There's no part of anything that Jesus taught that I can find anywhere remotely suggests that we live, we die, and we live again. Roman, or John chapter 11, verse 26, Jesus said, Whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. He says in verse 25, and I, I'm going to take a, almost an entire week on these two verses of Scripture because there's a definite separation here. John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said that if you live, that if you believe in him, you'll die, but you'll live again. Then in verse 26, he says, if you live and believe in me, you'll never die. Now, most of us have lived in that 25th verse with the concept that we live, we die, we enter into life. But Jesus said, verse 26, if you live and believe in me, there is a continuity of life. This is called immortality. There's a continuity of life. Now, I'm going to be really bold right here. I'm going to be really bold. The whole spiritual death thing comes from theological gymnastics. The words spiritual death never occur in Scripture. You cannot find the word spiritual death together. Just like, this is a rabbit trail, you cannot find where Jesus said, repent of your sins. Every time he talked repentance, he talked it to the cleanest living, highest living group of people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He said you need to repent from your unbelief. So there's no, no such phrase as spiritual death, either from Old Testament or New Testament. Nowhere in Scripture is spiritual death found. We, we created that concept based on Genesis chapter 2, verse Genesis chapters 2 and 3. We've said that when man sinned, he separated from God, he died spiritually. I, I challenge you. I challenge that idea. You cannot find that. I mean, let's get real. The idea that a spirit can die or be dead has always, always seemed to me to be unreasonable. I mean, how do, you kill, how do you kill a spirit? How do you put to death a spirit? It can be asleep. I can see how a spirit can be unawakened, how spiritual eyes can be closed. But spirit is eternal. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God breathed into man, and at, that, at Genesis 2, 7, man was not formed. He breathed into dust. <clears throat> and that dust became man. So what we have, what, the makeup of man is dust and eternal life of God. You take the eternal life of God out of the dust, it returns back to dust. See, but it doesn't die. It never did die. It has always lived and always will live. In Genesis 2, 17, when he said, the day that you eat this, you surely die, has brought in a lot of confusion. That they, they still lived. Let me say it like this. There are a lot of men on death row in Texas. They've been sentenced to life. They've been sentenced to die, to be executed. And that, that sentence of death was pronounced on them in a day. And some of them have lived on death row 20, 25 years. And it's what we call dead men walking, right? They're dead, but they're still living. Because that execution has not taken place yet. They haven't physically died yet, but they're as good as dead. So Jesus, what, what God was telling Adam in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 is that the day you eat it, you're as good as dead. It may take a while. It took a thousand years. That, that, word, that word day, as it's used right there, has four, four different meanings. It can mean a literal 24-hour day, which in this case, they didn't die in 24 hours. So that's, that, that meaning does not work. It can mean a time period. They did die at, a, at some point in time. So I think that's a valid translation. It can mean a lifetime when, when the scriptures were day. It can mean a lifetime. At that point, they were not living a lifetime. There was no lifetime that they had lived out. They had no lifetime before they sinned. It was, it was endless. It wasn't. So that's not a valid translation. And, and it's sometimes a day can mean a year. 
You know, the scripture says that with the Lord, a day is a thousand years. So it, it can mean a, a literal year. Well, they didn't die in a year, so that's not a valid translation. So the only legitimate translation I can see is that it meant a time period. There's only one definition that makes sense, and that's a time period that is not preset in length. So when God said, the day you eat it, you'll die, they were dead men walking. They were on death row. And that's what Jesus came to unwind. Now, I don't, I don't read anywhere in Scripture. I don't find it any place where Jesus came to fix some spiritual death problem so that we could live and then die and then live again. I think he came to totally eliminate death by eliminating the sin problem. See? The wages of sin is death. So sin to die is no longer an issue. Did, did the gift neutralize the wage? Did the gift satisfy the wage? Did he, did he pay for all sin on the cross for all men? Did he absorb all men into himself and die the death? We just read three, four scriptures. Let me, let me give you this one. John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist sees Jesus. He says, there he is right there. That's the Lamb of God who takes away, watch, the sin of the world. If the sin of the world has been extracted, then the, there is no wage for anybody to pay because of sin. Sin is, sin is a moot point to God. He doesn't see sin. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I hope I'm sparking some interest this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. What was the healing? The healing was death. He took away the death. He himself bore our sins, and when he bore the sin, he got the wage for it. He got the wage for every person. That we, having died to sin, might live eternally for righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. The, the debt that sin could pay or collect, which is death, was paid. If we have no sin, then there is no wage. If we have no sin that pays no wage, there is no death. No sin, no death. Right? And I told you to start. The way we begin to manifest things in the kingdom, kingdom truth, is we first embrace it. <clears throat> we let that crock pot, we then begin to believe it. Then we can begin to speak it. See, I'm speaking it this morning. Because I begin to embrace this, I don't know, three, four, five years ago. I begin to see... What is this spiritual death thing? Why did Jesus really die on the cross? What did it accomplish? And I embraced, I, I embraced, I didn't understand. I still don't fully get it. There's a mystery to this on some level. But I begin to believe it. Now I'm convinced of it. And because I'm convinced of it, I'm able to speak it. Amen? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I may go a little shorter this morning because of all that I'm dumping out here. I'm going to get you thinking this week for sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says this. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. When he became sin for us, he collected the wage of sin, which is death, spiritual death. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, here's, there's a great exchange. We exchanged our sin for his life. Did, did you see that in that second, in, in second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, here's an interesting thing. We're going to get into this next week. Let me just say this. Throughout Scripture... Wherever you see the word righteousness, it equates to life. There's never death in righteousness. 
Righteousness equates to life, just as sin equates to death. So when you read the word righteousness in the Bible, you're, what you're really reading, you, you need to see life there. There's no death in righteousness. Righteousness means right standing. Righteousness means as he is, right? The Father knows that we aren't capable of earning righteousness. So he removes the work from us and he takes righteousness, the life, and he imputes it, which means he, he direct deposits it into your life. So it comes by grace alone. You don't earn it. You don't earn this life. You don't earn the righteousness. He took our sin and in exchange gave us his righteousness. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4 and verse 3 says this. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. See, there it is. Before he ever believed God, he embraced what God was telling him, you be the father of many nations. And when he believed God, it was accounted or counted to him, given to him as righteousness. You are made righteous by believing. Lambano. Lambano means that you take hold of what belongs to you. Sin equals death. That does not belong to you anymore. Because of the cross, it does not belong to you anymore. What belongs to you is righteousness. What belongs to you is life. It's fully yours. The gift has been paid for. It's totally, it's totally a grace gift. Exactly what happened. So how, how, how did all of this begin to enter the human race? Right? It came through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm, I'm sorting back through my notes here because there was something... See, if there was some part I had jotted down here that I wanted to make sure I really emphasized to you, but I don't see it, so I'll, I'm sure I'll pick it up in another week. All right? So let me let me just recap this. I've, I've only been on this 32 minutes, but I know I've, I've laid some eye-opening truth out here. We've never, we've never considered immortality. Now, immortality to me, let me define what do you mean by immortality. Jesus said this. He said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down, the power to pick it up. That's immortality. I don't, I don't plan on living five, six, seven, eight hundred years. But I do plan on living until my race is completed, till my course is finished. I plan on living until I can say like Paul, I've fought the good fight. I've I'm, I'm completed everything I need to complete. Now that might take... You know, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, 120. I don't know. But I'll know when that time comes. In the meantime, I'm indestructible. Disease is not going to take me out. Men cannot take me out. I, I relate with Jesus. No man takes my life. I lay it down. And I pick it up again. I think Paul demonstrated that, for example, when he was stoned. Stoning was a sure death sentence. After they stone Paul, which the last stone that you throw crushes the skull, it's a big stone, crush the man's head, make sure he's dead. They walk back into town. Paul gets up and follows him back into town. He, he, he endured the beating with, with whips, 39 stripes, so three, four times. One time it's meant to kill you. This was administered by professional executioners that knew how to rip the flesh off of your back and your sides, so there was nothing left of you. You were just a bleeding pulp. Yet Paul survived. I believe he died. I believe he should have died, but he was immortal. So Paul was able to pick his life back up. No man took it from him. He lived until he said, I'm satisfied. And then he just made a transition. I think the transition is, is a little bit like Jesus' transformation on the Mount of Transfiguration. I think it's more like a transfiguration. You know, Jesus just shined like a light. He transfigured before them. And yet when he came back down, he was still able to eat. When he rose from the dead, he had a glorified body. I think that's what you, you move into when you, when you let this flesh body go. But this flesh body does not have to die till you're ready. It, 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 you're not going to experience death. So let, let me just recap this. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, 
He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, what was it that was actually lost to mankind? What was lost to mankind was physical life through sin. Now, sin, listen, listen to me carefully. Sin is the word harmatia. You know that, right? It means to miss the mark. It's actually a term from archery. When you shoot a bow and arrow and you shoot it at a target, you know, it has big target, small target, then a bullseye. Whenever you miss the bullseye in archery, that's called a sin. The sin was missing the mark. It was eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What was the bullseye? The tree of life. If they would have continued to eat from the tree of life, death would not have entered the human race. They missed the, they missed the bullseye. They missed the target. So when God said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. What was lost to man was, was, was physical life. All right? The bullseye was the tree of life. God said, they eat that tree. Don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate from that tree, whatever that means. Whatever you think that, however you think that worked. But in doing so, they missed the mark, which made sin and death entered, as God said it would, through that. Jesus came and died for our sins, our missing the mark. He took it upon himself. Now, the word lost in, in uh, Luke chapter 10, 19, verse 10, came to seek and to save that which was lost, is the same word in John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Perish and lost are the same words. They're both translated death, physical death, among other things. So what did Jesus come to do? Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save to heal, to preserve, to rescue the lost or what they had lost on behalf of that lost life because the wages that, that sin had paid in the human race was death that originated from eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> as we diminish, as there comes a generation, you're trail breakers in this, that no longer eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but you eat from the tree of life, Death will exit through the door it entered, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this morning, what I want you to get out of this is this. He took all of our sin, equal death, on himself. And he gave us, John 10, 10, 10 abundant life, zoe, unending, no death to it, life of God, perfect. I want you to get this morning, Jesus solved the sin problem. From God's vantage point, there is no sin. Now, identity, I've taught a lot on identity. Identity is seeing you as God sees you. We need to see us through the lens of no sin. You say, man, I mess up. You may mess up, but from God's eyes, the giver of life, the one that said, I'm going to send Jesus to collect the wage for your sin, the wage of the whole world, so that once again we can move you back into the abundant life. Jesus came and he solved the death issue by solving the sin issue. Can you see that? That was the plan of the cross, still is the plan of the cross. Jesus defeated death for all of us. So we're going to keep getting into this. I'm a little bit shorter this morning, but I think I've said all I need to say on this to introduce it. You probably can't embrace it yet. Don't, don't start making yourself believe something you're, you're not convinced of, right? The convincing comes through the embracing. Just take it. Ask the Spirit of Truth about this, and let's let Him over the next five, six weeks begin to show us part of what we have because of the new creation because of the finished work of the cross, because of the restoration in all things. See, you've been able to embrace and believe and speak those things. Now it's coming down another level. Do you think when people begin to walk in the earth not subject to death as every other man is, do you think we're going to have to evangelize? I don't think so. 
when there's a group of people that no longer are affected by sin and disease and physical death until they're saying, I'm done, my race is run, I'm ready to hook them back where I came from. I don't think so. People are going to want exactly what we have. So let's begin to process to embrace it. Amen? All right, I think that's good. We'll take up a little bit more of this on Wednesday night, maybe come at it from a couple of different angles uh, so that I can help you not to choke on this big piece of meat. I've tried to cut it up in small little bite sides so we can eat it easily, all right? Thank you for being with me. Thank you for support. Oh, I might just say this. This is the last week you can register for the Journey One Conference with uh, Steve McVeigh, McVeigh, Malcolm Smith, and myself on uh, January 2021. If you haven't registered, just do it. It's 99 bucks, big deal. Just do it. Just do it. People have asked me, why are you charging for this? Well, it takes work, first of all, but I also feel that it takes some input from you. It says, okay, look, we're partnering in this with you. We got some skin in this game. And we're, what it's, it seems like when we do that, then we do show up. If we just had registrations, people would not show up. It would not be important to them. When you attach a couple bucks to it, attach a couple bucks, all of a sudden it becomes a priority. So go ahead and register, get set up for that, and we will be in Bandero for a couple of days. But we'll be back next Sunday morning on the Digital Cathedral. Same time, same, same station. God bless all of you. See you there.